morning, dear colleagues. Uh, good morning, distinguished speakers and all those who follow us online today. Um, we're very happy to welcome you today uh, to the second live discussion about the joint initiative of the uh, European Union and the Council of Europe Partnership for Good Go Governance. On Monday, we've already discussed uh, the challenges the programme has faced since its launched, uh, launch of its second phase in 2019 and the priorities that can be identified for the future. As we all know, and as um, for what will work, the ultimate goal of the initiative is to improve the lives of citizens in the Eastern Partnership region. This is also the general title of our event this week. However, our joint work to achieve this goal can be threatened by external shocks. And this year, such a shock that has changed the life of practically all of us, of all of you, all over Europe and all over world, uh, the world has been undoubtedly the COVID-19 pandemic. So today we will focus specifically on how the Partnership for Good Governance in its work in the Council of Europe and the EU more generally have responded to the COVID-19. What lessons could be learned from this response in the Eastern Partnership region? We will look at how our priorities have been adjusted, at how our activities have been redesigned, and we will look at which other ad hoc measures have been taken. We will also see what best practices have emerged from this uneasy period. As the event goes on, I would like to remind to you that you can pose questions to our panelists using the Q&A question and answer panel on your screens, ideally indicating your country and the organization you work for or media outlet. Our panelists will do their best to reply to some of these questions. And finally, we would like to encourage all of our speakers to limit their interventions to five to seven minutes and to mute their microphones after finishing. Dear colleagues, as we've already mentioned and as we've already stressed on Monday during our first live session, we're all aware of the very difficult times the Eastern Partnership region is going through, is living through, with tensions mounting very high in our region. However, we would like to remind to all the participants and speakers of today's event that it's first and foremost about technical cooperation, and we trust that all the inter interventions today will focus on these issues only. We would also like to reiterate that all the statements and interventions from the speakers today are made by them in their own capacity and do not express the opinion, neither represent the official position of the Council of Europe. With that said, I would like to give the floor to our first speaker, who those of you who have followed us on Monday already know, Mathieu Bousquet, who is the head of unit at the Directorate General for Neighbourhood and Enlargement Negotiations at the European Commission. He has been working with, European, with Eastern Partnership countries since uh, the past eight years. And Monsieur Bousquet manages bilateral assistance uh, to Georgia and Moldova, as well as thematic assistance to all the six Eastern Partnership countries in the field of economy and the field of governance. Mr. Bousquet, the floor is yours. Good morning and thank you very much. Um, welcome to everyone. I would like, uh, of course, to thank the, the panelists for their participation and all of those of you, I mean, who are joining online at this uh, second live panel. I mean, I hope that uh, between Monday and today you had some time, I mean, to go on the, on the website to look at the numerous testimonials that we have on, the, on what the PDG has been doing over, over the last years. So today, I mean, we are going to speak a lot about COVID and the impact it has, the impact it has on the region, but also the impact it has on the PGG and how we, together with the Council of Europe, have reacted uh, to uh, support the partner countries in these times of, uh, of COVID. It's very clear to everybody, we're living in an unprecedented situation caused by the COVID-19. And as Commissioner Varre put in his uh, video message, unprecedented times require unprecedented response to manage the challenge ahead of us. And in that respect, I mean, it's important to show that the EU has shown solidarity and cooperation with Eastern Partnership countries. In a record time, 
the EU has put together a massive financial aid package, resulting in a joint communication of the global EU response to COVID-19 adopted on the 8th of April, so very rapidly after the outbreak of uh, the pandemic at a, a global level. It represents the first response of the EU and consists of reallocation, reorientation and acceleration of disbursement, notably of existing and not yet programmed funds. So the total EU support package for the Eastern Partnership countries includes 80 million euros for immediate needs that were already delivered and about 900 million of, for short-term needs from both the regional and the bilateral allocation. What did we cover with that? And it's part of a Team Europe response. We've supported immediate health needs and resilience so we put together a health regional action implemented by the World Health Organization covering mainly medical supplies to a 30 million and we are going to increase that. We are supporting economic resilience and particularly the SMEs which have been uh, severely affected by the crisis. It includes 130 million of new funds and more than 200 million of credit lines. I'm speaking in euro every time. Uh, why, our de-risking instrument under the EFSD, the European Fund for Sustainable Development, will mobilize an amount of about 500 million, half a billion euro for the entire neighborhood to ensure that real economies can stay afloat. And the third point is support to civil society and vulnerable groups. An additional 10 million is foreseen to boost grassroots civil society actors in the Eastern Partnership to support and protect the most vulnerable but also to ensure that we tackle disinformation and support free media in the East. This is also quite important. In addition, we've made available additional resources for a regional rapid response mechanism. This is about the regional funds, but of course we have reused our bilateral assistance to further reorient and accelerate the delivery of our existing programs to give support to also fiscal resilience. So we've given important uh, uh, amount of uh, money to partner countries, 92 million to Armenia, 60 million to Belarus, over 30 million for Azerbaijan, over 183 million for Georgia, over 87 for Moldova, and almost 200 for Ukraine. In addition to that, we've provided macro financial assistance package, which were adopted for Ukraine with 1.2 billion, Georgia 150 million, and Moldova 100 million. These are big amounts of money, but these amounts of money are certainly I mean, to support uh, uh, the fiscal space of the partner countries, so that I mean they can continue to pay the salaries of uh, the different uh, people when we are using budget support and macrofinancial assistance. But also very concrete projects on the ground, I mean, to help the people and the SMEs which are mostly affected by the crisis. What is also true, and this is why we are coming today on uh, uh, discussing COVID-19 in a discussion about governance, is that all this amount, I mean, calls for stronger accountability and uh, a stronger transparency in the way the funds are managed and allocated. And this is where the PGG takes all its Tense. So the COVID-19, it has exacerbated existing systemic uh, problems related to good democratic governance, corruption, ensuring access to quality, efficient, independent justice for all citizens, protecting vulnerable groups from discrimination are ever more important to ensure a fair recovery. So this is in line with the Team Europe approach, to build back better, leaving no one behind. So in the context, and I'm sure Pilar is going to expand on that, but in the context of our recovery efforts, the PGG is, we see the PGG as a fundamental instrument to promote and protect democracy, alongside with human rights and the rule of law across the EAP region. Without democracy, long-term economic development, social justice and prosperity cannot exist, nor can peace and stability. So well, that's key. And during this challenging month, the PGG has shown flexibility to adapt to the new challenging pandemic environment and the specific needs of Eastern Partnership countries. It was mentioned in the video, I'm sure Pilar will expand, but let me still highlight two, two examples. The work plans of each of the regional and country-specific projects 
have been adjusted to ensure results achievement. We have developed new outputs linked to the COVID-19 response in the AP countries. As an example, the PGG has supported partner countries in sharing lessons learned on how to adapt the impact of the pandemic in the efficiency and functioning of justice systems as part of a dedicated CEPEJ plenary meeting. meeting. Also, the PGG has raised awareness about the CEPEJ declaration on ensuring the full respect of the rule of law, human rights and fundamental freedoms while adopting and implementing state of emergency to counter the virus. And this is not valid for Eastern partnership countries. This is valid for all the Council of Europe member states, including all the member states. So I think this is important. The video also showed example and the need also to move to digital. And when you talk about digital, I mean, data protection comes to mind as something which is very important in terms of good governance. So moving forward, we are sure that the PGG will continue to support a just recovery in the EP region, allowing to implement the post-2020 policy priorities on resilient and accountable institutions. But overall, it is very clear that the EU stands close to its partner countries in this time times of COVID-19. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this insightful uh, presentation and indeed for outlining the ways uh, that uh, the cooperation between the EU, the Council of Europe and the partner countries has developed over this uneasy period and uh, how we can work together to live through the recovery period. So, uh, as you've mentioned, uh, the European Union has been working hand in hand with the Council of Europe uh, in um, throughout this uh, uneasy period. So. Um, I would like to give the floor now to the representative of the um, Council of Europe, Pilar Morales, who is the head of the programming department of the Office of the Director General for Programs. Uh, Pilar joined the organization in 2013, and since then she has op um, um, occupied several positions in the Council of Europe uh, since 2000. Uh, um, since 2011, she has been in charge of coordinating the uh, technical cooperation in uh, Council of Europe member states and neighboring countries in accordance with the strategic priorities of the organization. And she is also the focal point for negotiating of facility type programs like the Partnership for Good Governance with the European Union. Before I give the floor to Pilar, I would like to reiterate that um, we are very interested to listen to all your ideas about the future priorities for the um, European Union and for the Council of Europe in the region, not only in the context of the COVID-19. Uh, that's why we have launched an online suggestion box on our website where everyone who is interested in uh, this uh, theme can submit your views, your proposals about the future of the Eastern Partnership, and uh, we will work on these proposals and present the summary of the main suggestions uh, in due time. Besides, I would like to remind to uh, all, all of our audience that they can post their questions in the Q&A panel on the screen, and we will do our best for our panelists to reply to these questions. Now I would like to give uh, uh, the floor to Pilar, Pilar Morales. Thank you. Thank you, Tatiana, and thank you, Mathieu, too. Um, well, I'm glad to, to take part in this panel, which uh, is very, very timely because of the critical juncture we, you know, were created by the COVID outbreak. And I think that uh, this event uh, has shown through the discussions and all the material available that advancing human rights and rule of law reforms remains a priority in Eastern Partnership countries, but that the COVID situation has added another challenge to advancing the reforms forward. Um, why? Because, well, on the one hand, uh, Eastern Partnership countries, like other countries, face uh, social, political and legal challenges to respond effectively to the sanitary crisis because uh, the protective measures to combat pandemic inevitably touch upon the rights that are part of uh, an integral part of democratic societies. Um, and to support governments in their efforts to, um, to deal with the crisis while uh, preserving the fundamental values of human rights, rule of law and democracy, the Council of Europe produced at the beginning of the pandemic a toolkit, a specific guidelines for governments. And this document is available in the, on, the, on the events website in different languages. On the other hand, also, the pandemic has added implementation obstacles very concretely 
to the projects that support uh, reforms uh, in Eastern Partnership countries on human rights and, and rule of law, like the Partnership for Good Governance. Unlike the European Union, the Council of Europe cannot mobilize uh, uh, huge amounts uh, of uh, uh, money in order to support uh, these countries, but uh, we have, uh, as underlined by Mathieu, uh, continued and managed to, to continue the support through the Partnership for Good Governance, uh, because once more this uh, program has shown uh, or demonstrated its flexibility. Risks during the lockdown included, for example, discontinuing the core function of judiciary, including uh, making access to justice more difficult. To counter this risk, the Partnership for Good Governance put the emphasis during the confinement on pursuing uh, training for legal professionals, including, for instance, on issues like uh, access uh, to women, access for women to justice. Um, besides uh, the, I mean, with a view to moving to digital, the, the program, for example, supported the introduction of case management system for the Constitutional Court in Georgia, which has allowed SIMS citizens to file complaints electronically. Other measures like, uh, you know, the uh, CEPES declaration, which was mentioned by Mathieu, uh, are important steps in order to, to continue um, in this direction. During the lo lockdown, too, the legislative process in many countries slowed down, with consequences, of course, regarding the adoption of legislation. Despite this situation, the Partnership for Good Governance managed to do a considerable amount of work to continue um, alignment of legislation um, of Eastern Partnership countries with European standards. Uh, for this, we focused a lot during the uh, confinement on uh, desk work and research work. And an example in this direction is also the quick response mechanism, which, as you, uh, I hope, already know by now, is a tool under the Partnership for Good Governance that allows to provide the legal expertise by the Venice Commission. And during the confinement, the Venice Commission dealt with four requests submitted by Armenia and the Republic of Moldova, and the relevant legal opinions were adopted by written procedure. COVID also means additional difficulties for certain vulnerable groups in our societies who are, unfortunately, still subject to discrimination. To help them through the PDG, uh, we took a number of measures. Uh, an example is the Georgian Bar Association received a, a grant to provide legal services to uh, socially vulnerable families who were falling outside the social benefit system, and we identified these families together with the government. We also focused on protecting the rights of women victims of violence who are more seriously threatened in all our countries during confinement. Um, and, I mean, in, in this context, we did, uh, I mean, we continued uh, promoting the principles of the Istanbul Conventions through uh, different means. In other areas, too, the Council of Europe has tackled pandemic-related risks, uh, for example, by training journalists to ensure free and timely information, which is uh, very critical in times of, uh, you know, uh, crisis to report uh, back on to report to the to the public on the on issues related to the pandemic uh, we also did training of uh, media professionals in certain countries of the eastern partnership uh, to uh, promote a more responsible journalism in times of crisis also some cooperation projects were able to deliver uh, material and personal protective equipment in penitentiary institutions in the eastern partnership and therefore contributing to the government's efforts to uh, protect the rights of persons deprived from liberty. The PGG also continued developing tools to effectively implement legislation and standards. I would like to mention in particular the HELP program. HELP is the Council of Europe Human Rights Training Program for Legal Professionals, which has demonstrated during this period to be uh, particularly well adapted to the, I mean, to provide targeted support uh, during the sanitary crisis. And this has uh, been shown in an increasing, I mean, very significantly increasing number of users of this uh, online program of human rights. 
Only in the Eastern Partnership region, 2020 has already seen an increase of around 50% of the total users of help in the region, reaching almost 9,000 people. Hence, we can say that uh, capacity building on the European Convention on Human Rights uh, has continued uh, during the uh, COVID uh, restrictions thanks to the HELP program. Of course, all this work uh, has been possible through a common mobilization of the European Union, the national beneficiaries and the Council of Europe to adapt working methods to the uh, restrictions in force. Um, and we all know, and I think we're all aware by now, that uh, online activities can simply not replace um, in-person contact. That's clear. But we have tried to do the best uh, um, in our situation, in this situation. And um, I mean, we, we should also um, say that even in certain cases, uh, this uh, difficult situation has offered new opportunities, like, for example, mobilizing uh, high-level experts more easily because they were available, or uh, organizing online events to reach out to a wider audience. Huh? And, uh, well, this online event on the PGG meter results is an example of alternative means of implementing activities. I would like to underline also that uh, the continuation of the work during this period has only been possible because we've uh, counted on a very strong commitment from the national uh, partners in the Eastern Partnership, uh, Eastern Partnership region. Um, and despite some technical difficulties here and there, overall, they have demonstrated, again, very, very strong commitment to the implementation of this program. And uh, their participation online has been constantly very high quality and very active. And also, I think that the successful implementation of the program during confinement and uh, you know, the, the sanitary restrictions um, has been successful because of very close coordination between the Council of Europe and the Uni European Union at all levels, including in the field. Well, this is a unique situation. We've all been living since uh, last March. And this will be most likely, for all of us, our very fundamental experience of the 21st century global society. I think we will all remember this. And I think this situation forces us really to think also in terms of innovation. Uh, so I'm looking forward to taking part in the debate, uh, which should allow us to draw more lessons from you know, the situation we've been living, our recent experiences, and to openly exchange on what can be improved. And I hope also uh, that this will be possible thanks to observations from the audience. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pilar. As uh, you have um, mentioned already, the cooperation with the beneficiary countries, the cooperation with, with the experts, with the participants of the projects uh, with, uh, from the beneficiary countries has been exemplary during this period. And uh, of course, we all understand that uh, the key goal of our work uh, of this program is to bring national legislation and practice in the Eastern Partnership countries closer to the European standards and to help the national authorities in implementing these domestic reforms. So you already touched upon how, of, on how COVID has changed the way the uh, national authorities work. Uh, in implementing these reforms. And now we would like to listen to, to hear from the representatives of the partnership countries themselves how their work has been impacted by the new realities of the COVID-19 pandemic and what lessons have they learned from this new experience. I'm very pleased to give the floor now to Serhii Sayenko, the Deputy Director from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Ukraine, who works at the EU Regional Policies and Strategies Directorate General for the European Union, and acts as the National Coordinator of the Partnership for Good Governance program in Ukraine. Mr. Soyenko has been with the Foreign Minister of Ukraine since 1995 and has held several positions in directorates and departments responsible for relations with the European Union, as well as in the missions of Ukraine to the EU and other European and international structures and organizations. Mr. Soyenko, the floor is yours. Thank you, Tatiana. Uh, your moderation is very much appreciated. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, uh, 
the uh, well wishers of the Eastern Partnership, Monsieur Bousquet, Senor Morales. It is my pleasure to take part on this online conference today and uh, to see all of you in good health. I wish you swift relief from the pandemic and secure return to normal life. Uh, COVID-19 has become the real test for our healthcare systems, economies, and in particular, for our solidarity. I am pleased to know that the current crisis has proved in practice that the Eastern Partnership is visible for our societies. I would like to take this opportunity to express my sincere gratitude for comprehensive support that the EU has provided to the Eastern Partnership countries to withstand the pandemic and its socioeconomic implications. For Ukraine, this includes emergency aid, macrofinancial assistance, support to vulnerable groups of population, uh, foremost in the east of Ukraine, grants and loans to support SMEs, expanding the EU green lanes for return of Ukrainian citizens from Europe, and invitation to the EU Health Security Committee, as well as joint actions to counter disinformation. Unfortunately, the end of this crisis yet out of sight. Negative, active, uh, negative effects of COVID-19 uh, on our economies and business are unavoidable, but still difficult to assess. However, what is now crystal clear is that there is no other way to withstand the crisis but by stronger cooperation and mutual assistance. It is necessary to mention the importance of the freedom of movement between the EU and Eastern partners, secure but non-discriminatory reestablishment of people-to-people -people and business contacts, resumption of air traffic as well as revival of tourism will contribute significantly to our affected economies. COVID pandemic has also revealed our vulnerability to growing external disinformation campaigns. The Eastern Partnership region has become a target too. The goal is evident, deactivate Eastern Partnership and destroy confidence among EIP countries. We welcome consistent steps that the EU takes to tackle this problem and propose the following initiatives in order to intensify our common efforts in this regard. First of all, it's a joint panel EIP EU East Platform for discussing issues related to tackling disinformation and elaboration proper solutions. Envisaging participation of the Eastern partners in the events of the European Center for Excellence for countering hybrid threats. And finally, allowing engagement for the interested partners into the work of the EU agencies for the network and information security, so-called ENISA, and the EU Rapid Alert System. Defeating this information is possible only by joint forces. Since its establishment in 2009, the Eastern Partnership has successfully accomplished a number of historical benchmarks, namely ambitions, association agreements, free trade and visa liberalization on one hand, and significant European reforms did by partners on the other. The incentive-based policy and more for more approach proved these officials. They should remain in the core of our discussions about the EAP future. Our achievements should constitute a strong basis for further integration with the EU, as well as bringing our societies and economies closer together. Now it is high time and the main task for the future EAP summit to agree on our strategic vision on the post-2020 Eastern Partnership and set its new long-term benchmarks. I commend the approach of the European Commission 
to prioritize economy, connectivity, and resilience. We believe that the Eastern Partnership should remain strategic. The perspective of the EU for freedoms for the Eastern partners is the best overreaching goal for this initiative. At the same time, we should stay realistic. We need to respect partners' individual ambitions in their relations with the EU, while preserving inclusivity, which means equal opportunities to reach a particular level of relations with the EU, and similar conditions for that differentiation principle has to be further strengthened. It will accelerate strategic development of the Eastern Partnership and provide stronger incentive for the partners. With the benchmarks for the next decade, we can find a place for the PGG programs for the next three years period. And I hope that future priorities, we can adjust to the EAP program, we can adjust to the PGG program, which became an important tool to promote rule of law, democracy, freedom of speech, media, and many other initiatives. Thank you, Tatiana. Thank you very much, Mr. Sayenko, for your intervention. It's indeed very important for us to have your views as the representative uh, of the of the partner country of uh, as the Partnership for Good Governance Coordinator in Ukraine on uh, what challenges uh, you had uh, during the COVID crisis and uh, what priorities you see uh, in uh, the continuation of the cooperation with the European Union and the Council of Europe. Uh, of course, uh, you're right, the end to the health crisis is uh, out of sight and uh, there is no other way to um, withstand the crisis than, to, than through cooperation. So um, now I'm pleased to give the floor to the national coordinator of the Partnership for Good Governance from another Eastern Partnership country, from Azerbaijan. Uh, Leila Hasanova has been the uh, Partnership for Good Governance National Coordinator in Azerbaijan since 2020. She's the first secretary of the Department of Cooperation with Human Rights Institutions at the Department uh, at the Foreign Ministry of the Republic of Azerbaijan. And uh, her portfolio covers cooperation between Azerbaijan and the Council of Europe in the areas of human rights, democracy and the rule of law, including implementation of the Council of Europe Action Plan for Azerbaijan. Prior to joining the Council of Europe desk in the Department of the Foreign Ministry, Mrs. Hasanova coordinated cooperation with the UN Human Rights Council and other relevant bodies of the UN human rights system. So now we are looking forward to hearing from Mrs. Hasanova how the work under the Partnership for Good Governance has been going on in Azerbaijan, especially in the situation of the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you very much, and the floor is yours. Uh Thank you very much. First of all, I would like to thank you for uh, invitation. Uh, yes, uh, the European Union Council of Europe joint program partnership for governance implemented in Azerbaijan. Uh, currently, three PGG national uh, projects are implemented in Azerbaijan. They are strengthening anti-money laundering and asset recovery, strengthening the efficiency of uh, and quality of judiciary in Azerbaijan. And the new project has just started uh, raising awareness on Istanbul Convention and other gender equality standards in Azerbaijan. Also, we're active for all in all bank regional PGG projects. As you all know, PGG is primarily considered as an information and experience sharing platform. Uh, it's a platform for exchange of knowledge, uh, ex expertise, and from this perspective, our overall assessment of cooperation within PGG has been uh, positive. Our national have benefited from the project on the PGG, and here I would especially like to mention project Pressing to judiciary uh, reforms and other important like uh, combating corruption, 
uh, economic crimes, hate crimes, uh, access to justice for women facing domestic violence or uh, discrimination. Activities implemented in the framework of PGG make their own contribution to the all ongoing uh, processes and measures in these critical fields at the national level. Working closely with uh, national authorities, other stakeholders, a program helped to improve uh, national authorities, public uh, institutions, and train professionals their information, trends, uh, and best practices, national and projects. Important to emphasize, the PGG should keep focus long-term impact of its initiatives, particular uh, to further investing in developing pool of a local trainers and experts, building capacities of national institutions, and responding to concrete needs uh, of the local partners pertaining to policy and legislation. Also, retain its flexibility in terms of taking into account uh, particularities of each national context, so that its project bring real added value uh, to all us uh, as partners. Speaking about the COVID impact, uh, COVID-19 and its impact of on the implementation of PGG, it's true that the pandemic situation, uh, the pandemic crisis, has had a note impact on political and social life in countries all over the world. And the implementation of PGG has been no exception in this regard. Uh, but fortunately, we were able to adapt rather quickly to new realities and challenges. A wide range of online uh, conferences, meetings, events, evaluation meetings, trainings, seminars took place over the course of the last months. The pandemic situation did not prevent us from the starting of the new national PGG project, uh, as it was mentioned before uh, at the beginning of my speech, the raising awareness on the Istanbul Convention and other gender equality standards in Azerbaijan. The project will cooperate uh, with the Azerbaijan uh, authorities three main fields, its legislation and policy, pro policy frameworks, uh, its capacity building measures and awareness raising measures. And we hope that this project will be very fruitful for both sides, for all beneficiaries and stakeholders, and help to understand better what the Istanbul Convention is, uh, help to raise awareness on the content and aims of uh, this very important international instrument. And the main point is that the cooperation under the PGG uh, umbrella remains ongoing and we all are doing our best to achieve more tangible results. Uh, as regards COVID-19 pandemic, uh, I would like to uh, very short brief information on response measures complemented in Azerbaijan. Uh, Azerbaijan adopted the robust strategy to fight COVID-19 and to minimize the impact of the pandemic on the population. And in its global efforts to fight COVID-19, the data with the states uh, affected by the virus, uh, Adorgen has donated 5 million US dollars to WHO, World Health Organization. Additional 5 million US dollars were donated to WHO in support of most affected 100 members of the non alignment movement. And uh, this step was highly appreciated by the uh, Director General of WHO. And the virtual summit of Cooperation Council of Turkey speaking states and non member states uh, dedicated to fight against COVID 19 were held at the initiative of Azerbaijan. And during the online non summit, the President of the Republic put forward an initiative special uh, session of UN General Assembly dedicated to uh, COVID-19 and this special session 
uh, was held on July 2020. Among other recent measures, I'd like to know the pardoning presidential decree, uh, which granted pardon to more than 100 prisoners aged over 65 years old in need of special care to their age and state of health. It was uh, also granted, uh, the, the order granted early release to more than 600 prisoners and granted other alternatives to imprisonment to more than 300 inmates. Uh, let me just uh, use my right of reply uh, to briefly react to the groundless allegations made by the representatives of Armenia during the first day of our meeting with regard to the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict between uh, our two states. As you are aware, 20% uh, of internationally recognized uh, territory of Azerbaijan is occupied by Armenia, and as a result of this ethnic cleansing by Armenia in Nagorno-Karabakh and surrounding seven uh, districts, one million Azerbaijan IDPs have been forced out from their native lands. 27 September, Armenia launched another aggression against Azerbaijan by intensively selling the civil settlements and military position, causing many deaths and injuries among civilians. Therefore, Azerbaijan was obliged to launch a counter-offensive measures using its right to self-defense under Article 51 of the UN Charter. This counter-action is aimed at enforcing Armenia to implement four well-known resolutions of UN Security Council, demanding immediate and unconditional withdrawal of the armed forces of Armenia from the occupied territories of Azerbaijan, as well as Council of Europe uh, Parliamentary Assembly uh, Resolution and 2085. Nowadays, Armenia regularly shells uh, hospitals, courts uh, in the Azerbaijan cities located far from conflict zone and front line and already killed 27 and injured about 170. So we call on the world community to firmly condemn these war crimes perpetrated by Armenian I really apologize to exceed the frame. Uh, we have to, we have to, unfortunately, unfortunately, give the floor to other speakers uh, because the yeah, time is running okay. short. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your uh, for your intervention. We would like, as I said, to remind to all the participants that uh, it's event, this event is about technical cooperation, and so basically we expect the statements to focus on this topic. Um, to continue our uh, discussion today, of course, we understand that uh, no uh, work to promote human rights, no work to promote democracy and rule of law is possible without the active participation of the civil society, of the NGOs. And um, that's why I'm very happy to give the, plo uh, the floor to the representative of the Civil Society Association uh, today, especially that uh, this association is not based in the Eastern Partnership region. So uh, it's quite uh, interesting to listen to the experiences and to about the work of the Eastern Partnership Civil Society Forum. So um, the next speaker is Sofia Strive, who is the co-chair of uh, the Eastern Partnership Civil Society Forum and the EU coordinator of a working group in this forum, which focuses on good governance, human rights, and the rule of law. Sofia is working at the Swedish organization Forum SIV, which is an umbrella organization for civil society organizations in Sweden, uh, where she is a coordinator of this Swedish civil society network for Eastern Partnership and Russia. The network aims to strengthen cooperation between civil society uh, in Sweden and the Eastern Partnership region and um, to raise awareness to conduct political advocacy on human rights. Um, Sofia has experience of working with gender equality issues in Ukraine and Georgia before. I give the floor to Sofia Strader. Thank you. 
And first of all, I wish to thank all of you for very interesting reflections, insight and knowledge that has been shared by previous speakers today, but also this Monday. It is a pleasure to listen to others who also burn for this region and aims to ensure that the recovery now after COVID-19 and the future cooperation between EU and Eastern Partnership, Eastern Partnership and EU, becomes as inclusive, sustainable and effective as possible beyond 2020. So when Corona hit the Eastern Partnership region, countless of unforeseen things changed and there are plenty of lessons that we can learn and conclusions that we can draw from this. However, I want to underline, just like Mr. Isainko did, that we are still not completely through this crisis and we don't know for how long we can continue. And with that said, I will highlight two main things that we have identified as um, things that we can learn from these special times. Firstly, I wish to emphasize that the role of civil society has played in terms of support to vulnerable groups and people in need. Many civil society organizations quickly stepped up or adjusted their way of working to be able to reach vulnerable groups, especially those such as elderly, unemployed, homeless, and people living in poverty. And through fundraising and provision of food packages and other necessary items, the civil society organizations in the Eastern Partnership region has proven to be essential for these people to live through the pandemic. Moreover, the civil society also played a key role in supporting professionals in the healthcare sector. And when local governments did not manage to adjust to the quickly changing reality, the civil society did to a large extent substitute key governmental services. And all in all, this shows that the strength of the civil society in the region is both flexible, innovative, and has a high ability to adapt. Secondly, I also wish to speak about something that is a closely health-related outcome of high relevance to the context of COVID-19, especially in this region. Um, one tra tragic lesson lessened the, the COVID-19 pandemic that we cannot ignore is that isolation, curfew and lockdown of societies heavily increased the number of cases of domestic violence. And I wish to stress that it is equally important to create recovery mechanisms for this when planning ahead. And I'm happy that the PGG has focused on domestic violence and, for instance, supported the work to reach a ratification of the Istanbul Convention in Armenia, uh, made steps in Moldova, Ukraine and Azerbaijan. Even though these efforts are, and its implementation in reality needs to be further strengthened, just like Mrs. Laila Hasanova touched on. Domestic violence has unfortunately always existed, uh, but with this obvious increase, real mechanisms to stop men's violence against women need to be taken seriously, and sufficient shelters, psychological support, and legal help centers need to be put in place and further improved. Now, I will also speak on uh, what the Eastern Partnership Civil Society Forum, as well as myself, view as the main priorities ahead. And firstly, um, when having resilience as a main theme in the upcoming years through the deliverables beyond 2020, I would like to stress that no society can be resilient if not all groups of the society are included. And that is why in a post-crisis era, Systematic focus on the most vulnerable groups and those who support them needs to be taken into account when designing and implementing resilience building strategies. Groups that have to receive more attention in this regard are people with uh, physical and mental disabilities, youth, LGBTQI people, unemployed and elderly. And I'm happy to hear that from Mrs. Pilar Morales that vulnerable groups are specifically targeted in the PGG but there's still much more to be done in this regard. Secondly, if there's anything that the COVID crisis clearly has showed the world, it is that an, a nation is only as strong as, strong as its health care system is. And thus, for the future year, both the EAP policy and the bilateral support to the Eastern Partnership have to strengthen the health services and capacities at both local and regional level, in urban as well as rural areas. And the access to the quality of medical education. For instance, 
the curricula in the medical schools had to include trainings for epidemiologists, which currently is lacking to a high degree. I also find it important to note here that an increased capacity, accessibility and quality of health services, with that I also mean mental health services, such as psychological assistance. And thirdly, a strong and independent civil society and media has played a vital role in speaking up against governments and local leaders when democracy is at risk, when rights are being disrespected or when people are mistreated or silenced. And this has clearly been shown both in light of disinformation connected to Corona, but also when restrictions are being used to silence oppositions and when the result of an election is not respected. And it is therefore vital that EU continues with its targeted support to local civil society and independent media in this region, both as an actor in enabling an inclusive recovery, but also in its role for monitoring government's actions to fulfil promises and respect the voice of its citizens. And in this regard, it is important that the grants given to civil society and media are both large and small in their size. Uh, that's the only way that it could reach organisations of all size, all scope and all capacities, which is important to continue uh, to do. It's also important to continue with support to regional cooperation, and I really want to stress this, uh, to further emphasise that the Eastern Partnership is a region that is stronger together. There is much more than I can say here, uh, but the time is very limited. So for those of you who are interested to learn more, I would recommend you to visit the website of the Eastern Partnership Civil Society Forum, where we have published policy papers with further recommendations. Thank you so much for your attention, and I'm looking forward to the Thank you very much, Sophia. It is indeed very important to hear the voice of the civil society, to hear the, about the problems on the ground, especially with the most vulnerable groups of uh, the society that very often have very little possibility to present their viewpoints. And so that's why we would like to thank you for your uh, intervention. And we would like to thank all the distinguished speakers for their presentations. Now uh, let's look at the questions that um, we've received for our panelists. Uh, if you don't mind, we will uh, do as we did um, during the first live session. We will go, um, we will look at the questions that we already have. So sorry for looking at my phone while you were speaking. I was uh, basically looking at the questions that we were receiving. Um, we will uh, start with the questions to Mathieu Bousquet, representative of the European Union. Um, you have mentioned uh, the massive uh, financial assistance, the massive funds that uh, uh, the EU has given to the Eastern Partnership U uh, region during the COVID uh, and f during the recovery period. We have a question. What oversight mechanism is in place to verify the appropriateness of the funds disbursed to the Eastern Partnership countries and how transparent is their spending? So it basically echoes another question that we had before about the control measures put in place to ensure that these funds are well used. You have mentioned this uh, challenge uh, in your presentation, but um, if you could specify a bit more in response to this question, we would be very grateful. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, indeed, I mean, when we are talking about these big amounts, I mean, of course, I mean, it's important, I mean, to think about what are the oversight mechanisms. Uh, I think, I mean, I'd like first to start by a, a more general uh, a point, which is our support has been targeting different components of the Eastern Partnership societies. Mm -hmm. So, and I think everybody recognizes, and that was also Sophia's intervention just right now, I mean, the need to target also the vulnerable people. So, it's, it's very important to know that the uh, crisis has accentuated existing fractures in uh, um, the societies of Eastern Partnership and also EU societies, and it has affected different categories of population differently. You, you were, Sophia was talking about the difference between uh, uh, cities and rural areas, about uh, different uh, uh, regions, but also women and men, people with disabilities. So this is something that we really need to to, to tackle uh, in the future. Uh, as we emerge from the crisis, I mean, we need to reverse 
those accentuated fractures. And this is why, I mean, we need to target our assistance to the most uh, vulnerable. And as I mentioned, I mean, part of our assistance was targeting the most vulnerable people. And we do that working with civil society organizations in particular. I think on the oversight mechanisms that we have with civil society, I mean, we have plenty of mechanisms, I mean, to ensure uh, uh, that the civil society uh, are, are spending the funds in the way they uh, uh, they say they will manage that. And, uh, and we have good experience in, in that respect. That's the first element. The second element is support to uh, SMEs. It's important to keep the economy working. This was mentioned by Mr. Sayenko as well. Uh, and we are providing access to finance to SMEs, particularly on the working capital, so that they can continue working in this period of crisis. We work with IFIs, with banks. We are using the mechanisms of the international financing institutions and the banks in uh, the loans uh, and the preferential loans that are given to uh, uh, the SMEs. The third part is direct support by the Commission contracting directly a number of partners, for example, WHO, to procure medical equipment. I can tell you that the financial regulation that is imposed to us, I mean, is quite tough and the accountability is big on that. So on that, uh, I think we have a, a full oversight and, and accountability, including by the Court of Auditors. Now comes the fourth part of uh, this support, which is direct support to governments. And this is where we have received a lot of questions from citizens from EU and from Eastern Partnership about the accountability mechanism. And I guess the question here is targeting specifically that. Sorry, I was a little bit long, but I mean, that's just to make the difference between all the figures. And we have two major mechanisms, I mean, to provide support uh, to uh, uh, partner countries. I mean, to the government is a macro financial assistance and, and budget support. And here we have inside the agreements with the partner countries some mechanisms. For example, in the MFA, we have a clear line that says, I mean, the payments are conditional to the respect of rule of law, human rights, and democratic standards. So that's a condition, and we are making an assessment before making the payment, whether this is uh, uh, in place. That's about the MFA. The same in the, in the budget support. But in addition to that, I mean, responding to this need of further accountability and transparency, and I mean, this echo very well what I was saying on Monday. I mean, the tolerance to corruption, the need has really decreased. The need for further accountability is now much more part of civil society, and the citizens want to know what is uh, what is uh, going and how it is uh, taking place. So we are supporting the watchdogs and civil society is part of them independent media so we are strengthening our support on, on independent media we are strengthening our support on anti-corruption policies this is what we are doing with the pdg anti-corruption mechanisms but also i mean with oecd and of course there are also some institutions that do exist in partner countries the court of accounts the audit institutions in each country for example one of the programs we have with one partner country i don't want to name it we have put a condition that the fund that we are going to support are going to be specifically looked at by the Supreme Audit Institution of this country, which is a very reliable institution and that puts all the results in public domain. The transparency is key, watchdogs, public procurement is also key. I mean, in another country, I don't want to name here, in another country where I work very hard with a, partner, with a partner country to ensure that public procurement is fully transparent and is accessible to everybody. It's also public procurement online, which limits the capacity of corruptors to corrupt uh, 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 the uh, public institutions. Vigilance of CSOs and of the citizens is essential. It was mentioned on, on Monday, and we need to, to continue uh, on that. So I think this is also part of the recovery mechanism, and Mr. Sayenko mentioned it. I mean, it needs to be inclusive. We really need to think differently uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the building back, and this is why also President von der Leyen said, we will build back better. 
And in the better, we have the inclusivity, we have the sustainability, we have the uh, sustainability at large, but we have also the better governance, democratic standards, human rights, and rule of law. I think I tried to respond to your question. Sorry, I was a little bit long, but I wanted everybody, I mean, to get the feeling about our support. Thank you very much uh, uh, indeed for this comprehensive response to the question and especially uh, for the information about the mechanism that he used to control the um, the usage of the funds uh, that uh, that are put. I have a question for Pilar, uh, but it's a more general question, I would say. So as the, it's a question from Azerbaijan. As the COVID-19 crisis has been unprecedented, don't you think that it's better to concentrate efforts on more basic needs, for example, um, providing medical materials and aid that advise on legislative reforms? Why should we keep focus on human rights while there are more pressing needs? Yeah. Okay, thank you for the question. I'm I'm sure that maybe other speakers, you know, other panelists would, uh, you know, may wish to to react to this question. Um, well, I'm strongly convinced that uh, human rights remain in the COVID the situation as relevant as, as always. And I think that, uh, I mean, we should not leave any uh, margin for undermining the, uh, you know, I mean, the, the achievements um, in human rights uh, area. Um, some of these achievements are still uh, fragile. And I think this is one more reason to continue protecting uh, these rights and promoting these rights, uh, fundamental rights, during the um, sanitary crisis. Not least because, as I mentioned in my speech previously, um, the, the, I mean, dealing with the, with the sanitary crisis um, in the Eastern Partnership, but also, you know, in all, in all uh, countries, um, can encroach with uh, fundamental rights. And, uh, and we have to take measures to avoid, indeed, that, uh, again, fundamental rights are undermined. We have even certain cases, including in uh, Eastern Partnership countries, where um, the member states of the Council of Europe have requested the derogation of the application of certain provisions of the European Convention on Human Rights to deal with the crisis, that I see uh, as an expression of their concern to continue protecting democratic societies and, and human rights uh, and their commitment to protect these rights. Um, and, uh, it, well, you know, what can I say to, to this uh, in reply to this question is that I really believe that, on the contrary, it is extremely important during the sanitary crisis to continue protecting uh, human rights uh, and rule of law achievements in, in all the countries. Thank you very much. Um, we have a more specific question now. Uh, almost all the speakers have mentioned the Council of Europe Convention uh, on, the, on the protection of women against the domestic violence and uh, violence against women. So the so-called Istanbul Convention, uh, Ms. Hasanova, Mrs. Hasanova has mentioned that uh, during the COVID uh, epidemics, uh, Azerbaijan has launched a new awareness raising project uh, to um, inform the society, the public, about the convention. So we have a question for Pilar and uh, specifically for Mrs. Leila Hasanova uh, in relation to this convention. If you don't mind, I will group these two questions. So first of all, how did PGG contribute to address the issue of violence against women and to improve women's access to justice during this uh, COVID uh, epidemics? And to uh, Mrs. Hasanova, we have a question. Uh, there is a problem of violence against women. It's enough to check the news. Azerbaijani government is aware and concerned by the problem and even produce and disseminated some social ads. So the question is why, still, uh, why Azerbaijan still hasn't signed and ratified the Istanbul Convention. If you could uh, reply to uh, these uh, two questions, uh, that would be great. First, I give the floor to Pilar. Well, thank you, Tatiana. I think the, um, you know, the, the uh, situation of violence against women is a common challenge that we face in all countries, in all our countries. And as you say, to the Council of Europe created this landmark treaty, which is the Istanbul Convention, um, to protect, uh, you know, women against uh, violence. 
And uh, I just wanted to highlight that uh, in the region progress, in the Eastern Partnership region, progress is still to be made in this in this regard because this convention has been ratified by most uh, European Union and Council of Europe member states. But in the region, it has been only so far ratified by Georgia. So, I mean, the, this is one of the reasons why the Partnership for Good Governance is very much focusing its action on uh, promoting the, the Istanbul Convention. And, uh, well, the, um, I mean, I will mention what the Partnership for Good Governance has done during the um, confinement, during the, the lockdown on this uh, specific uh, matter. But I also want to, to remind that, um, you know, we have this toolkit for, you know, that was prepared at the beginning of uh, the lockdown for governments uh, so that, you know, they could deal with the sanitary crisis effectively while protecting uh, human rights and rule of law. And uh, uh, this uh, document, which again is available in 14 languages uh, on the uh, events website, uh, also refers to, uh, to the situation of uh, uh, victims of crime, including victims of uh, domestic violence, um, and noting that uh, during the sanitary crisis there, there has been everywhere an increase of uh, reports uh, showing that uh, uh, the policy of isolation and confinement has led to increasing uh, levels of domestic, sexual and gender-based violence. And so the action that the Council of Europe has taken is, of course, in line with the Istanbul Convention. And we've uh, made a big effort to disseminate in all member states, including in the Eastern Partnership countries, information uh, about the principles of the Istanbul Convention and made recommendations to the, to the governments uh, in order to, to protect the victims, to continue prosecuting the crimes uh, against uh, these people. And uh, I mean, now we're, we're speaking now specifically about uh, victims, uh, women victims of violence. But we don't, uh, we don't have to forget that. Uh, I mean, we we have other categories of vulnerable people, like children, for example, who can be victims of violence. And in line with the Lanzarote Convention of the Council of Europe, um, governments have, have been encouraged to uh, to um, to put in place, for instance, like access. Uh, uh, helplines uh, so that children can, um, you know, can uh, uh, speak about their abuse, abuses. Huh? Um, and well, as part of the Partnership for Good Governance, of course, we've pursued uh, during the uh, lockdown the efforts to promote the Istanbul Convention. So work in this uh, has not stopped. And regarding specifically uh, the question of access to um, women access of women to justice, we've uh, continued putting in place the, um, I mean, first of all, the HELP program to train legal professionals to facilitate uh, uh, access of women to justice, but also the mentoring program that started as part of the PGG has continued uh, being put in place. Um, a lot of awareness raising work has been done uh, at all levels, uh, high level professionals in the, at the national level, but also NGOs uh, role in raising awareness about gender equality and, uh, and the Istanbul Convention and so on. And uh, well, I invite, um, you know, participants also to consult uh, in the online event uh, the information which the information which is available regarding the, um, you know, the achievements so far in this specific area. Thank you very much, Pilar. Uh, now, um, Mrs. Leila Hassanova, if you could uh, uh, briefly uh, respond to the question about the plans uh, uh, of um, um, uh, the Azerbaijani government regarding the uh, Istanbul Convention. And we have another question for you, if you could maybe respond to it as the second part of your response. How do you assess the performance of national authorities in implementing Cooperation, pro, uh, cooperation projects uh, uh, by adapting to the COVID situation. So if you could give, uh, say, a few words about that, that would be great. I would like to remind our speakers to remain brief in their uh, responses because we are slightly running out of time and we still have uh, uh, quite a few questions. So I give the floor um, to respond to these questions to Mrs. Hasanova. Yet, but on the cooperation now, and this actively discussing by all uh, relevant authorities, 
uh, Virginia government out a large uh, scale of programs, uh, strategies to um, implement not access facing violence, domestic violence, or this. So uh, we are active participants. As you know, uh, access to justice for women, uh, and uh, the one of the main uh, aims of new started uh, program, national program of peace. Uh, government, they are tasked towards signature So uh, this is on the consideration and the table now. Uh, thank you very much. Even though the technical um, the technical quality of uh, the connection was quite uh, poor, so I personally couldn't hear um, uh, a lot of uh, your response. But um, uh, but uh, thank you for uh, outlining the position of the Azerbaijani government uh, regarding the um, the Convention on Violence Against Women. Um, we have a, a short statement and a question from the uh, EU delegation to Ukraine. So, first of all, the uh, European Union delegation of, uh, to Ukraine would like to thank the colleagues from the Council of Europe uh, implementing joint EU COE projects in Ukraine in rule of law area for great cooperation and partnership. And uh, the question is, uh, will future, and this question is uh, again fed by the COVID situation. Will future PGG projects add regular online activities to their assistance toolkit? Our work under COVID-19 restrictions has proven their efficiency and, if used to a wider extent, online events, which don't require elaborate logistics, will allow for more project activities on the same budget. I don't know whether this project is, uh, whether this question is uh, too technical to reply, but if, uh, if um, either Mr. Sayanko, for instance, could uh, reply whether he sees uh, this as a possibility, and then maybe uh, EU and the Council of Europe representatives could add. Uh, thank you, Tatiana. Uh, well, actually, uh, I mentioned also that we appreciate very much uh, the, all types of initiatives, agenda, and the action plan uh, provided by the PGG for Ukraine uh, for the Eastern Partnership countries. With all necessary initiatives, we need to we need to implement uh, to do internally. Uh, the point is that well, COVID uh, requires uh, restrictive measures. So that's true, but anyway, uh, we are already adapted to have uh, consultation process, negotiations, technical meetings. Uh, anyway. Uh, through online video conferences, we can uh, negotiate, we can talk, we can assess. Uh, what, what, what about the budget? What is concerned the budget? Well, uh, it is, uh, it is not pure topic uh, of, of my house actually, but anyway, we are open, we are free to consider uh, any initiatives we have on the table jointly with, uh, with Strasbourg, Brussels, or you delegation. In uh, we have a set of priorities for the next EAP uh, programs or benchmarks for the next decade, and uh, I see already the place for PGG uh, involvement. And uh, I would like to say that we we stay uh, we stay uh, as a partner uh, anyway uh, the, on the PDG program, and I think we'll be able to continue our dialogue jointly with the EU and Council of Europe to implement priorities defined uh, by all the sides within the PDG program. Thank you very much. Um, indeed, uh, the question uh, relates uh, 
to a large extent to the um, to the organization to the technical side of the of the issue but it's a uh, very uh, um, it's very good to have your view that uh, online uh, activities have uh, proven quite effective during the during this period so I would like to ask Pira, uh, Pilar Morales if she if she can add something. thank you Tatiana very briefly um, I will reply on the basis of thorough analysis we've carried out uh, you know regarding the implementation of all projects uh, of cooperation during uh, COVID. Um, and uh, well, I think as we have already mentioned, uh, we have to uh, underline that online activities can simply not replace face-to-face uh, -face work. I don't think this is feasible in the long run. Uh, we have managed as part of the PGG and other projects to, uh, to continue, I mean, to ensure business continuity of project implementation. But we, I mean, we have done a, an important effort to adapt the activities. Uh, so the activities we've implemented online are not necessarily those that were planned in the beginning. Because we've noted, for example, that the large scale uh, and long events are very difficult to organize online because it's very difficult to, I mean, to retain the participants' attention during a long period, and it's very difficult to organize an online event with many, many participants. So, for example, what we did is, in order to ensure uh, specific training, we were uh, doing several, um, you know, several trainings instead of one. Uh, as initially planned. But also, we noted that it depends very much on the nature of the projects. So whenever you have a project which is politically sensitive, it is much more difficult to, to I mean, to organize, to, I mean, to run the project online, for sure. Uh, and also, if we're, I mean, we, we, one of the conclusions, you know, from our side is also when we are going to start a new project, to launch a new project, it is very, very difficult to do online because you need in the beginning, this uh, contact, uh, you know, person to person with the partners. Uh, this being said, of course, you know, in reply to our colleague in the European delegation in Kiev, uh, we will, uh, I mean, we've, we're drawing lessons from, from this experience, and there are also good things from, you know, what, that we've learned from, uh, from, uh, from this uh, confinement experience and online activities. And as I mentioned earlier, in certain cases, in certain cases, it has been more easy to uh, mobilize certain high-level experts who are because they, they they were available more easily uh, if they don't have to travel or we i mean we we've used uh, also events to have a um, you know more participants so to reach people for example also at the level of the regions and not only in the capital and so on and so forth so we will draw lessons from this and uh, the idea is that we will uh, also in the future plan the activities in a way that whenever it is possible or better to hold an activity online, we will, of course, do. Um, and I hope also that uh, very soon we will be able to move to hybrid types of events where we will have the possibility to have uh, participants at the national level meeting in the, in the country with experts, uh, international experts online. So we're already moving from one stage of the implementation related to COVID to a different uh, one, which will be a little bit more open and more efficient. Thank you. Thank you very much, colleagues. As the time is running short, I would suggest uh, we have a question for Sophia about the civil society, and then we have a more general question. I'll read it out. Uh, I'll read out the uh, question to Sophia. Uh, do you think that civil society organizations in the region have been hit harder by COVID than other actors? And uh, the uh, question with which we would like to conclude uh, the discussion, uh, it comes from Ukraine again. Uh, because of the COVID-19, the Eastern Partnership countries have introduced unprecedented restrictive measures. Many of them are still in operation. How do you assess the impact of these restrictions on the performance of key indicators and midterm results of the second phase of the PGG? So I would imagine that's rather for the EU and the Council of Europe. But first, let's listen to Sophia and whether the uh, civil society has been more affected by COVID than other actors of the society. First of all, thank you for the question. I think it's important to uh, look at this. Um, it's Fairly difficult to reply to that because I don't know if it's valuable to compare actors and who has been the most affected by uh, COVID-19. Simply, everyone has been affected, and from my point of view, every citizen is part of civil society. So, by that means that every person that 
is one way or another affected by COVID-19 is kind of part of the society. But if we speak about organizations as such, well, then I think they have been heavily affected. I'm not going to compare them to other actors, but they have been affected in terms of uh, both isolation, since many of these that we recently touched upon, uh, usual physical meetings and physical events and travels have been like from one day to another totally uh, stopped and therefore it's a different way of working when meeting online and it doesn't give you the same kind of effect so that is one thing that heavily have affected then secondly to to implement projects has also been adjusted to a whole new reality and many projects that civil society is running I have adopted but it takes different um, time frames to adopt to a new reality depending on what you work with so some have been affected more heavily than others but in terms of those civil society organizations that support vulnerable groups and people in need uh, women especially and people that are usually um, not taken care of seriously in the societies those organizations have seen a huge demand and a higher increase of people in need. It has put people in vulnerable positions because of unemployment. It has put people in vulnerable positions due to health-related cases, not only health connected to COVID-19, but health-related things because the health sector has been under so much pressure. So everyone else have also been affected, uh, even if you have other illnesses. So it's uh, this uh, crisis has kind of slammed the whole society. And with that, it also affects those that work with supporting the society. And I want to come back to here the previous questions that if I understood it correctly, it asked if why focusing on human rights when there are other things should be uh, focused on the first. And I think this is something that I really want to take the opportunity to stress that you could view, let's say, economic development or whatever you want to focus on as one main focus. But if you don't have the fundamental human rights put in place first, uh, there is no economic development that will be built in an inclusive and sustainable manner. So that's why by focusing on uh, creating human rights for all, that's the only way that we can reach some kind of development, be it economic or uh, environmental or anything else, because this is kind of the basis that we need to build a society on. And that's why supporting civil society to come back to as strong as it was before the uh, COVID-19 hit us is essential. Thank you. Thank you very much for this response. Now I would like to give the floor to Mathieu Bousquet with response to the question how the uh, unprecedented restrictive measures applied by the European, by the Eastern Partnership uh, states have impacted the results, the midterm results of the PDG. And if um, other speakers would like to add to his response later, we would be pleased to hear uh, to hear those. There, I just want I mean to reassure uh, uh, Sofia that I mean we are going to continue support civil society. It's quite important, as I mentioned before. And the second point I wanted also to mention is, you know, I mean, this COVID-19 has also shown that when we are talking about conventions, we are talking about the realities of people. And the example of domestic violence and the Istanbul uh, uh, Convention is a clear example, as was mentioned by Mrs. Sasanova. So what is important, I mean, there is a, an idea that these are abstract, discussions. No, it's very concrete. It's about people. It's about uh, gender violence. And in the COVID-19 times, this has been exacerbated. So I'm very pleased to hear the commitment of partner countries, I mean, to move forward in the uh, implementation uh, of, uh, of these different conventions. And I'm saying on purpose, implementation. Ratification is key. That was one of the 20 deliverables, which was not achieved as what we wanted. I mean, I hope it will be better in the future, but after ratification, there is also implementation and both are important. So that, that's very clear. Now on the support, we are going to continue under the PGG. As I said before, I mean, it will be important 
uh, as a lessons learned from the past that we can speak to concrete results for citizens. And that's also a clear lesson from the past is that we want and we've been working hard with the Council of Europe to ensure that our programs really target uh, results for citizens. We will continue in this respect and uh, I mean we will see with uh, the Council of Europe how to better even better frame the PGG so that it responds to the needs of uh, citizens of Eastern Partnership countries. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, do um, other speakers want to add anything about the restrictive measures and the impact that they've had on the uh, results uh, of the PDG program on the cooperation under the PDG program? Um, well, if Yeah, you said. Ah, oh, sorry. Um, apologies. Uh, I mean, in the end of the day, I have muted myself too profoundly. Um, so um, we would like to, uh, if other speakers don't uh, have anything to add about the um, impact of the unprecedented restrictive measures in the Eastern Partnership region on the rollout and on the uh, results of the PGG, um, well. If we don't have um, the speakers who would like to add something, then um, we would suggest closing this online debate. And uh, if we have more questions, we will uh, reply them and write in our forward to the panelists who, um, who were present today. So we've looked back uh, over these two days, over these three days, uh, uh, of what has been achieved over the past two years in the Partnership for Good Governance pro uh, prog uh, programs. We discussed what the future holds for the program. We've looked at how the work has changed uh, with the COVID pandemic. Um, we will now uh, show you a little video uh, about the uh, program, about its achievements, about its results. And at 12.15, um, there will be the concluding session featuring uh, representatives of the uh, European Union. So. Oh, oh, sorry, apologies. I've been corrected here. So immediately after the video, so that you don't have to lose your time, we will have a concluding session with Lawrence Meredith, who is a director of the Director General for Neighborhood and Enlargement Negotiations of the European Commission, and with Verena Taylor, the director of the Office of the Director General of Programs of the Council of Europe. So now the video and then the concluding session. Thank you very much.
after this little video break, um, I would like to move uh, to the concluding session of our discussion today and of this uh, uh, three days event uh, that was held uh, online and uh, um, on our website. Uh, you can uh, still consult all the testimonials, you can uh, take the quiz, you can uh, submit your suggestions about the future of the Eastern Partnership uh, region of the EU and the Council of Europe cooperation and work in this region. And now I would like to give the floor, and I'm very pleased to do this, to Lawrence Meredith, who is the Director of the Directorate General for Neighbourhood and Enlargement Negotiations of the European Commission. Mr. Meredith has been Director for Neighbourhood Eastern Institution Building Indigenous Year in the European Commission since the 1st of December 2015. In 2015, he was Head of Strategy in Indigenous Year of the European Commission and led work on the European Neighbourhood Policy Review. Uh, previously, he has worked for 10 years in enlargement policy, both as the Head of Strategy and Head of the Kosovo Issues Unit. He worked in the cabinet of Commissioner Louis Michel um, on Southern Africa and the Pacific. And uh, Mr. Meredith uh, studied Russian and French at Oxford University. So um, I'm very pleased to give the floor to Mr. Meredith uh, on behalf of the European Commission. Hi, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much indeed for that warm welcome. I felt I had my life flashing by me in seconds just then. Um, it's a pleasure to join this very important um, event at a very timely moment and to build on what I know uh, Commissioners Varhe and Dali have said, and also Ambassador Kunavur and Acting Director General uh, and my good friend Salah Sastamonen. Um, I mean, as the video very articulately shows, um, this program is very important for the citizens across the Eastern Partnership and is very much uh, uh, delivering results. I'm particularly pleased to see um, how active the contributions have been uh, throughout the three days uh, from civil society uh, as well as from independent media. We see a very challenging landscape uh, across the Eastern Partnership. Uh, there are, of course, important elections coming up in both Georgia and Moldova, local elections in Ukraine. Um, and, uh, but of course, above all, we see um, the uh, very important protests on the ground in Belarus, where the role of civil society and independent media is absolutely indispensable, as the European Council has just underlined. And we see the, the terrible resumption of hostilities over Nagorno-Karabakh and a call in line with the OEC uh, Minsk chairs for an immediate cessation of those hostilities. Um, and it shows how important this area um, is that we're all working on. And I thought I could um, briefly put this in the context of uh, the future of the Eastern Partnership, which was the um, proposal put on the table in March this year. Uh, we had a leaders' conference uh, of both the Eastern Partnership and the European Union in June. And we're looking ahead uh, to a physical summit, hopefully, in March next year. Um, I think there are five clear priorities, and it was, I think, one of the strongest messages we got from civil society of both the uh, Eastern Partnership and the European Union, as well as from our own member states. Perhaps, if I'm honest, a little bit less from the governments of the Eastern Partnership, was how important the values agenda is. Um, and uh, for that reason, whereas in the current setup we have four priorities, with one of them on governance, Looking ahead, we expect to have five priorities with two of them on the values agenda. And that will include, on the one hand, if you like, that, the harder security stuff that we've just been discussing, the rule of law, justice, tackling organized crime, where this program is already making important contributions. But also, and this is crucially important, moving towards a more inclusive society. And that's where we see the role of uh, civil society, local actors, independent media, youth education and research. So I think those are two very important pillars. Of course, as we've heard, the need to build back better, the economy and connectivity will be an absolutely key priority. It's going to be a devastating impact. And unfortunately, we still haven't really fully felt the economic impact of this terrible pandemic. We felt the health impact, but I fear the economic impact is 
really only just starting to bite. Um, and we stand ready on the side of the European Union to bring strong support on that. Uh, but of course also, and these are the other two priorities, looking ahead to build back better means we need a more digital economy, uh, as we can see from the very fact that we're able to have this important three-day meeting online. Uh, I think we've all improved our skills uh, digitally over the past few months, but uh, I'm sure there's much more we can and will learn. Uh, uh, and equally, the green transformation. And I was very, I, I'm always proud to be a European Union official, but I was particularly proud when listening to President von der Leyen's State of the Union speech recently, where she gave a passionate plea for more um, a green uh, transformation as well as a digital transition. And she very much put values at the heart of both the European Union's internal and external agenda. And I think that shows exactly how relevant uh, this PGG program is. And I'd like to thank all on the side of the Council of Europe, uh, as well as my own team for the commitment to bring together this very um, important event over the past three days. And above all, uh, looking ahead to the results of this program in the three main strands, which are absolutely crucial for delivering benefits to citizens. Uh, and I'm sure uh, that we'll all be tweeting uh, about this. And that just goes to show it's important to achieve results, but it's also too important to communicate the impact to citizens in a way they can follow. And I thought the video was an excellent example of that. And with that, many thanks to all, and over to you, Verena. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, to make sure that uh, Verena's life also flashes in front of her eyes, I'll just say that uh, Verena Taylor holds a PhD in political science, and uh, she has joined the Council of Europe following her involvement in the civil society work. She served in different parts of the uh, Council of Europe, including the Secretary General's private office and was director of the Council of Europe liaison office with the European Union in 2004-2008. Now, Verena Taylor, she is in charge of the office of the Dire Director General of Programs and is in charge of coordinating and implementing technical cooperation programs with some 30 Council of Europe member states and in the neighborhood. Verena manages a project portfolio of about 240 million euro and uh, 17 Council of Europe field offices. So now I would like to give the floor to Verena Taylor. Um, good morning. Hello, Lawrence. Hello, Tatiana. Good morning, all the many people who hopefully watch us and listen to us out there. At the beginning of this event, I reminded everybody that originally it had been meant to take place in Tbilisi in May in the context of the ministerial session of the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe. And that would have allowed us to meet and to have a direct exchange, to be motivated and inspired by each other. This version of the event, on the other hand, allowed us to reach out to some 10,000 people who have been following us in the last two and a half days at one moment or the other. This uh, sort of is a first reference to the digitalization that Lawrence just mentioned. So this is simply also a very different way of working um, and equally important. Mostly uh, the people who followed us, of course, were citizens of the region of the Eastern Partnership, uh, which confirms their wish for continued reform. The, region faces big challenges right now. We are all aware of that. And um, I think while uh, the uh, progress achieved also through this program may not always be apparent to citizens right now, it is nevertheless the case that more people in Europe enjoy the protection of their human rights and enjoy a fair and stable rule of law situation than ever before. And this is, of course, what we are aiming for also for the citizens in the Eastern Partnership countries. Importantly, this event has provided uh, an inclusive platform, bringing together representatives of many different wakes of life. Um, and it has been combining information, testimonials, and live events. There is also a suggestion box. So this is a very direct way of communicating with our participants. And I will come back to that uh, at the end. Um, the tremendous interest and feedback encourage us to continue working together with the European Union and the countries of the region to further promote human rights, the rule of law, and democratic governments with a view to improving 
citizens' lives. And if I say that, I actually really refer to measurable progress. The work that we have been developing together is not just discussions. We are actually improving uh, things, and this can be measured. And also to increase the democratic resilience of societies, of the societies in question. This resilience is also necessary to deal with the impact of COVID-19. This has just been discussed in the previous panel, I think, in a very interesting way. But dealing with the impact of COVID-19 in full respect of human rights and the rule of law. And in this context, uh, I would like to not only say that, of course, the PGG has proved to be a very flexible instrument that uh, made it possible to quickly introduce alternative working methods to continue work towards the uh, objectives we have uh, decided on together. But I would also like to uh, perhaps refer to the COVID-19 toolkit for Council of Europe member states that were launched by the Secretary General of the Council of Europe during the, the peak, the first peak at least, of the, of the pandemic. And uh, which is designed to help ensure that measures taken by member states during the crisis remain proportional to the threat posed by the spread of the virus and are limited in time. So I think this is something for those who are interested, you can find um, on the on the internet. Um, during these two and a half days, a number of priorities have been mentioned and discussed and the future referred to. Lawrence uh, just also did that. Um, of course, what we will finally do, what we will finally focus on, depends also on the parameters the European Union uh, deliverable set and the uh, monitoring recommendations of the Council of Europe monitoring bodies uh, suggest. I should nevertheless like to mention some ideas that were left with us in the suggestion box, because this is really what people said and not just what we as international organizations or institutions say. Um, I would also like to refer to the values agenda, perhaps, because briefly, because what this program does and what the Council of Europe does is translate general values of human rights, rule of law and democratic governments into standards that are tangibly influencing the life of people. So we're not, again, in the general realm, we're very, very concrete here. Now, in the suggestion box, we found among other things, uh, quite a few uh, requests to work more on human rights, uh, which is, of course, underlying all our cooperation, but not explicitly very much touched upon at the moment. And in this context, also very much the Istanbul Convention Against Violence Against Women and Domestic Violence, which is, of course, an instrument which still needs uh, a lot of awareness and progress in the Eastern Partnership region since only one country so far, Georgia, has ratified it. Um, there were also some very specific with regard, for example, to working with journalists and even to support investigative journalism, which in the context of uh, combating economic crime, for example, uh, might be something that uh, could be interesting. Um, Lawrence, you mentioned the green transformation. This is also an issue which has clearly very much, uh, which clearly very much enthuses our viewers and people who leave messages in the in in the suggestion box. And I'm very happy to say that in the Council of Europe we have actually just finished our first um, text that again tries to translate the general concept of uh, dealing with climate impact into very measurable and concrete steps that can be applied in every single project. And I'd also, of course, like to say that um, a fair and efficient judiciary can do a lot also to contribute to not just fighting economic crime, but very specifically fighting economic crime in the context of climate impact. Together with our partners, both the European Union and uh, the countries of the Eastern Partnership. And we will discuss all this and we will spend some time to develop, I think, a follow up to the current program in the future. Um, at the same time, of course, we will continue the implementation of this project and we very much look forward uh, to uh, pre presenting to you all the results at the end of the current phase of the Partnership for Good Governance. I 
should also like to say at the very end, because I have been asked to do so, that the results of the photo competition, which is also one of the one of the aspects of this of this uh, two and a half day uh, event, the results of the photo competition will be announced on the first of December. So don't forget about this event. Do come back on the first of December in order to find out who won the photo competition. So with this little light touch, I would like to wish you and all of us. Uh, all the best for the future and success, much continued success to this program. Thank you. Thank you very much for this concluding remarks. And uh, indeed, we uh, encourage everyone to visit the website, not only on the 1st of December, but before that as well, to take the quiz, to look at the um, fact sheets uh, in all the languages possible of the Eastern Partnership region. And to uh, and we are going to work uh, for you and we're going to work together with you uh, until the end of this phase and further. So thank you very much. Keep tuned uh, to the work of the PGG and of course, keep safe. Goodbye. Thanks a lot.